This is Mobile Suit Breakdown, a podcast about Japanese sci-fi mega franchise Mobile Suit Gundam for new fans, old fans, and not yet fans, where we watch, analyze, and review all 40 years of the iconic anime in the order it was made. We research its influences, examine its themes, and discuss how each piece of the Gundam canon fits within the changing context in Japan and the world from 1979 to today. Welcome to episode 1.12, Into the Storm. And we are your hosts. I'm Tom, longtime Gundam fan and not a Zaku. <laughs> and I'm Nina, anime fan, and if you'd like to get me a Christmas present, consider a JSTOR membership. This week, we'd like to thank Jason E. for his review on Facebook and Da Soup Man for his review on Apple Podcasts. Thank you both very much. We appreciate the reviews immensely, and not just because they said such nice things about us. We'd also like to thank Dan, Roddy, and Lucas for reaching out to us on Twitter to let us know their thoughts about the podcast, and to Reddit users Nobody Is Lurking and JFaith01, who gave us some very helpful feedback. Also thanks to Bag of Magic Food, who contributed some interesting points about the White Base's weird journey around North America, also on Reddit. This week we are discussing episode 12 of Mobile Suit Gundam, The Threat of Zeon. In Japanese, Zeon no Kyoi. Which literally means The Threat of Zeon. <laughs> This episode, we'll be talking about the politicization of large public funerals, directors and their influences, and miscellaneous new tech from the episode. Cool robots and sweet spaceships. <laughs> Before we get into our research, here's a recap for those of you who haven't seen the episode or may have forgotten everything that happens. As episode 12 begins, we learn that the aging sovereign Degwin ceded power to his eldest son, Girin, and only then did war break out. Zeon caught the Federation unawares, and their superior preparation left the Earth Federation helpless. The White Base, having escaped from Side 7 and defeating Garma, is now crossing the Pacific. In Zoom City, while crowds and dignitaries amass for Garma's funeral, Degwin sits alone, watching Garma's last video message. It is not until his daughter Kaecilia comes to get him that he joins the rest of the Zabi family on the public dais. Back on Earth, the Xeon ship Zanzibar spots a ship they cannot identify, and Lieutenant Rambaral suspects it is the White Base. The beautiful and mysterious Lady Haman, Rambaral's lover, is intent on completing their mission, vengeance for Garma's death. But Rambaral is cautious. They only have entry capsules to support the Zanzibar. On the white base, Amuro sits alone in his room, working on the backup computer for the Gundam. He acts normal enough when Fra brings him food, but Haro can tell that something is wrong, and Amuro eats mechanically, staring off at nothing. Bright is short-tempered and exhausted, snapping at his bridge crew and at the orphans. He goes to his quarters to rest, but his break is interrupted when the white base crew see the Zanzibar headed their way. In an effort to hide, the White Base flies directly into the cloud formation of a thunderstorm. The Space Noids, Federation and Xeon alike, are frightened. Most of them have never seen or heard of lightning before. Mirai lands the ship, and Bright orders the Gundam, Gun Cannon, and Gun Tank to prepare for launch. Ryu, who will be piloting the gun tank, finds Amuro sitting in bed, staring blankly. Ryu has to shake him and slap him to get his attention, and Amuro comes out of it clearly dazed. They rush to put on flight suits, and Amuro briefly panics, feeling suffocated by his helmet. Ryu has to take his hand and drag him to the Gundam, forcing him into the pilot seat. Terrified by the delay, Bright contacts them to find out what is happening. It's rookie syndrome, Ryu explains, before Sayla tells them that ready or not, they are launching. Rambaral himself deploys in a new mobile suit, one we have never seen before, accompanied by two soldiers in Zaku. Amuro struggles, fighting frantically, but without the strategy and skill of some of his past battles. Despite the fact that they seem to be winning, Rambaral orders a Zeon retreat. He and his men return to the Zanzibar and leave the White Base and the Gundam behind. Amuro, Ryu, and Hayato return to the bridge of the White Base to find that Zeon is broadcasting Garma's funeral as widely as they can. 
Char sits in a bar, watching Garma's funeral on TV. He is approached by a soldier whose face we cannot see, who has been sent by Kaecilia for reasons we don't yet understand. At the funeral, Girin tells the public of the evils of the Federation, dominated by elites and oppressing the people of the sides. He tells them that they have survived the war so far because their cause is righteous, and that Garma died to wake them from their apathy. He ends by telling them that they owe the dead victory, and the crowd erupts into shouts of Sig Zion. Only then do our side set Seven refugees finally understand who their enemy is and why they must continue to fight. This was a very dense episode. There is a lot going on. This episode tries to do a lot of heavy lifting and I think mostly pulls it off, but it does fall apart in a few places. What dominates this episode is absolutely Garma's funeral. I don't know that I would say it dominates it. It's the the way that it is intercut into all of the other action kind of slowly builds over the course of the episode and then becomes this big sort of revelatory moment for many of the characters right at the end. It's important, but it feels more like a current through everything than like something that's overarching or dominating them. It's both our introduction to the episode and where we close. And as you mentioned, it's woven throughout. We keep coming back to it. But also everything that happens in this episode, Rambaral's arrival, his attack on the white base, Amaro's condition, all of that is a consequence of Garma's death. Amaro is dazed because of last episode when Iselina confronted him, and that happened because of Garma's death. Rambaral is here because Dozel has ordered him to personally take revenge against the White Base. Everything we're seeing here is really the aftermath of Garma's death. Last episode was Iselina loves remains. This episode is everybody else what remains after Garma. We get some very essential background information in this episode about Zeon. Yeah, when the narration in the beginning of this episode starts and explains a lot of things about this war that we didn't know yet, I had the distinct impression that somebody, perhaps a representative of the sponsors or the network, marched into the Sunrise Studio offices and said, no one is watching this show and no one can tell what is going on. You have to explain things. And begrudgingly, the Sunrise staff agreed to explain things a little bit. So in this episode, we get another narrated opening that reminds us the Zabi family is trying to establish a dictatorship over the world. It tells us for the first time that the war started after Sovereign Degwin ceded his authority to his eldest son, Giran. And thank you, it finally tells us where the white base is, crossing the Pacific. Speaking of Amaro, things open with him in a sort of false stability. He's alone, but he's doing something he enjoys. He's working on the backup computer for the Gundam. Frau comes and brings him something to eat and something to drink. He says hello. He's not as closed off as we've seen him at other moments, but Haro sees through him. That's right. We need to update the people telling Amaro to eat tracker. Someone tells Amaro to eat. But Haro, you're right, Haro must have some special sensors because he detects that Amaro's brainwaves are weak, whatever that means. Well, and also just that Amaro is like, Genki Janai. Amaro is not Genki. Amaro is not well. Mm -hmm. And even when Amaro is eating, we get this shot of him sort of staring at nothing. He's doing everything very mechanically. Even once he starts coming apart, the sense is not panic. Before, he was scared and he was angry. Now, it's like he is just completely dissociated. <laughs> he is disconnected. Amuro's body is there, but he is not. When Ryu comes in, when the Zanzibar shows up and they have to get ready to fight, Amuro, the way they draw his eyes is just white orbs. He's sitting on his bed, staring expressionless. And when Ryu brings him back, <laughs> Amuro getting slapped count up to three now. Possibly three times in his whole life. Amuro seems sort of almost genial about this. Like, oh, you don't have to hit me. I know. I know I have to go fight. There's none of the anger and the resentment that we saw in the previous episode. He's very compliant. But he keeps falling back into that absence. 
He has a brief moment of panic when he puts on his helmet and he feels like he's suffocating. He feels claustrophobic in his flight suit. And Ryu is basically having to tow him along, sit him in the Gundam cockpit, put his hands on the controls, and he's still not there. And even when Sela calls out to him, he barely responds and... It's not until he's actually fighting when he's being shot and his bazooka has been destroyed that he's really in it. That's the only moment when he comes out of the fog and he's actually acting of his own volition. Everything before then is very responsive. And when I say compliant, that's not an accident. I mean, he's doing what people tell him, but he has no initiative of his own. A few episodes back, when we talked about reactions to traumatic stress, I mentioned one of the big ones is flashbacks. And we didn't at that point have any evidence that Amuro was having flashbacks. Now we do. He has a flashback of Iselina, particularly during the lightning storm, which scares everyone, Zeon and Federation alike. That was such a great touch. I thought that was an amazingly sensitive read for who these characters are and the lives they've lived and what the world they exist in is like. Frau and the orphans are the first ones we see, and a lightning flash goes off, and they think it's a new Xeon weapon, because these kids have never seen lightning before. Right, they're all space noids, right? They're yeah. all from outer space. They don't have the kind of atmosphere that produces weather. But then we get the counterpoint of the Zanzibar, mm-hmm. and most of the crew of the Zanzibar also have never seen lightning. Yeah. They are also space noids. The one guy who says, I think it's a new Federation weapon, is literally shaking in his boots. They animate his leg, like, jittering. And Ron Baral, I don't think, has seen lightning before. He's just heard about it. No, he has a line where he says he's seen it on Earth before. Okay. Uh, But he has this moment of, this is this Earth thing called lightning. It's just part of the weather. It's fine. And his wife, who's like, oh, okay, now that I know it's just a thing called lightning, I'm not afraid. No spoilers, but she is not his wife. Oh, interesting. She calls him darling. She calls him Anata. Mm -hmm. And there are several intimate touches between them. Yes, this is a relationship that at the time was considered quite risque. Oh, dear. Mm -hmm. Also the age difference. Um, Or at least... a, A notable Japanese novelist whose name I cannot now remember has actually said that this relationship was hugely inspiring for him to see this kind of very romantic and frankly sexualized relationship between these two characters who were not married and had none of the conventional trappings of an appropriate relationship. And to see it on TV at a young age was a revelation for this guy. Yeah, I bet. I wonder a little bit if they actually are, uh, if they actually do have much of an age difference, because to be fair... uh, In Asia, a lot of women look very young to a much older age than we might expect. And so does she just look younger than him or is she actually considerably younger than him? I'm sure the internets can tell me. It's a good question. Let's not rely too much on anything the internet says. (laughs) Both of these characters get changed quite substantially when they appear in The Origin. Ah, well then. (laughs) I'm starting to really hate The Origin, even though I don't know anything about it, except that it's a sort of retelling of parts of the original and covers some different characters and different pieces of things, but it really futzes up the (laughs) details for me. Anyway, we started down this road talking about lightning and the fact that when the lightning storm goes off, Amuro has a flashback of Iselina. He sees her standing there with her gun and announcing that she's here to get revenge on him. It does feel as if these last couple of episodes have been sort of a a peeling away of layers of ignorance around Amuro. Obviously, he knows he's killing people, and he hasn't totally come to terms with that. But he hasn't gotten beyond that point yet. He hasn't gotten to, like, the ramifications of that beyond him being alive and that other person being dead and that being because of him. He's not thinking about families. He's not thinking about governments. And this started, I think, not quite when Amuro came down to Earth, but probably in the episode with the widow and child, The Battlefield is a Wasteland, aka The Winds of War. Because in that episode is the first time that Amuro sees the Xeon soldiers behaving like people. And he sees them drop the supply crate for the widow and her son. And that's his first realization that the Xeon pilots that he's fighting are not all monsters. Now, he doesn't know Garma. He never sees Garma before Garma dies. So that's not as much of a factor for him. But he sees Iselina and he's fighting this gal. It's an enemy plane. And then after it crash lands, a beautiful blonde woman in a dress climbs out (laughs) 
and points a gun at him, and then she falls to her death before she can shoot him. And then he buries her, and now we're here. And again, he has to fight for his own life and the lives of everyone on the white base. Not very successfully no. in this episode. We have the Zanzibar rolling in, and we find out, basically from the beginning, that they are under orders from Dozel to pursue vengeance against the White Base for its part in Garma's death. However, Rambaral makes a few comments that make it sound like he has a slightly more complex plan for how they're going to go about this. He is going to chase them down, but it feels much more like a kind of investigative, exploratory mission. He wants to engage somewhat to kind of see their capabilities, but he's not concerned about taking them out right this minute. They also don't have the air support they might like. They have the Zanzibar itself, but the only other vessels they have are re-entry capsules, which really can't do much and actually depart the battle fairly quickly because they just don't have the range or the fuel to continue to support the Zanzibar. Mm -hmm. Well, and before launching with his new mobile suit and a couple of Zaku wingmen, Rambaral gives the order to collect as much data as possible. And after they've been fighting for a little while, he orders the retreat. And this is the first time we've had a fight where Amr has not killed anyone. Amuro does not manage to take out any of the enemy ships or mobile suits. And his bazooka is destroyed. I would say Amuro solidly gets the worst of this. And a person might be left wondering, why did Rambaral retreat at all? Indeed. Well, it's because unlike a lot of other Xeon craft, the Zanzibar cannot hover indefinitely. Oh, interesting. It had reached the end of its operational range okay. and it had to return to base. Fascinating. I had no idea. I should note that when I say the Zanzibar, I'm talking about a Zanzibar class ship, which Aww. may be the Zanzibar, who knows, but it is a Zanzibar. Okay. I did find myself wondering what precisely Hamon is doing there. I'm going to give a little laugh basically every time I say her name because it sounds like the Spanish word for ham, and I just like can't, I can't get over it. I can't say her name without thinking of ham. <laughs> so... <laughs> If you put her name in Katakana into Google Translate and let it automatically translate, Google will think you are talking about Hamon, the Spanish delicacy. <laughs> so anyway, what is Ham doing on the ship? Is she a military officer? Like, what? what is she doing there? She seems very personally invested in this vengeance plan. And also to... Uh, to really enjoy seeing Rambaral suit up and go into battle. We will find out more about Lady Hamon in the future. <laughs> you even did it with the accent. As long as there Hammond. are no... I have to, I have to like make myself say it without the accent. Hammond, not Hamon. Hammond, not Hamon. During the battle, Amaro has a shocking tentacle experience. Ooh. Well, and... The way these battles have gone previously, when he manages to use his shield to block that, like, electric wire. I forget what Rambaral calls the it. The heat rod. The heat rod. Which it's not it's a not, rod. And it's also not very hot. I think it's actually using an electrical charge there. Anyway, um, Amro manages to block the heat rod with his shield, goes in, punches Rambaral in the stomach, makes to grab his beam saber and slash Rambaral to bits, and he gets blocked. <laughs> And then kicked away. So, you know. And Rambaral is... says one of the most famous lines in Gundam. This is no Zaku boy. No Zaku. Which is funny because I had in my notes, a new Zaku appears. But apparently it is not a Zaku. It does stylistically feel like a weird departure because the the spiky nature of the armor feels almost medieval. More curved lines and ornament in a way that feels very counter the design aesthetic for the other mobile suits. It doesn't feel like it fits. I feel that. Hmm. I mean, it may just have been a case of needing to differentiate it from Zaku and be like, ah, oh, we'll stick some spikes on it. I don't know. <laughs> But it does, it feels very different visually than the others. So now that we're talking about the combat, I want to say this is a very visually dense combat. An enormous amount is happening. There are a lot of very quick cuts, short scenes, little bits intercut. And I don't think the animators were up to it. I think this is a situation where the director had a particular visual style that they were trying to bring to life for this battle and did not take into account the resources that were actually available to them. 
especially when you remember this is a new mobile suit, so there's no pre-existing stock footage of it. They can't cut in old footage the way they do for the gun cannon, the gun tank, and the Gundam. Speaking of, they used the same shot of the gun cannon from Kai's first fight in the gun cannon, and they do it twice in the same episode. The exact same shot. I found some of the visuals in this combat really lovely, actually. Yeah, a lot of it is really good. There are a couple of really beautiful still shots, I thought. Mm -hmm. Uh, Which, you know, we can talk about still shots being a bit of a cop-out for the animators because there's three seconds that you didn't have to animate. But they make a nice emphasis. It feels almost like a tableau or I think Tom previously has talked about how they remind him of old like ukiyo-e style paintings where you might see a painting of two samurai fighting and they're both locked in these very stylized poses. And that's what those stills feel like. Absolutely. But then when it's animated... Frequently, machines are off model. Perspective gets really weird. The heads, (laughs) especially, are all over the place. (laughs) There's one particular scene I'm thinking of where the Gundam gets tiny head syndrome. Oh, no. As as opposed to tiny hand syndrome, which (laughs) several of our viewers pointed out from the last episode. (laughs) We'll have to put some of these images from the battle on our Twitter. So if you're not following us on Twitter, go to Twitter. It's where we put funny images from the episodes. We open with a very sad scene of Degwin re-watching his last video message from Garma, which is Garma saying, oh, I should be home in a couple of months, but I want to get a victory. I don't want people to think I only got promoted because I'm your son. You know, I'll be home soon. Not to detract from the gravity of that scene, because it is really quite a sad scene, even when you remember how horrible all these people are, but the technology that they use for that video message, it's like a piece of magnetic tape that you put through what looks like an early Palm Pilot or Amazon Kindle. (laughs) Palm Pilots predate Kindles, dude. I know, but it looks like both. I had a Palm Pilot. That's how old I am. While Degwin is not refusing to do what needs doing... He's not exactly eager for the role he needs to play. Kaecilia has to come fetch him and take him out there. We get an overwhelming impression of worship from this crowd, that this crowd worships the Zabi family. The crowd is packed to the gills. I notice all the officials on the dais with the family are all in full military uniforms. So this is a military government. We don't see anybody up there who looks like they are not military. We have the gun salutes. We have parades of soldiers. We have the coffin being paraded in. And then we have Girin's speech. I wrote down so many snippets of this because it's horrible and amazing all at once, obviously. But trading on the kinds of ideas that I think are very familiar to all of us when we think about history. (laughs) Garma died to wake you up. You somehow thought that the war didn't affect you, that the war was someone else's problem, but Garma died so that now you know that's not the case. You know, never forget this sorrow and anger. We owe the dead victory. Yeah, I believe the line he has, which is, I wrote down, victory is the greatest tribute we can give the fallen, which sounds like it could have come straight out of any speech in World War II. And... The mix he gives of, oh, we were downtrodden, those darn elites took control of the Earth Federation. Those shadowy elites. And then started taking over space. And when we wanted our freedom, they wouldn't give it to us. And we are the oppressed. And we are the underdogs. We have one thirtieth the fighting strength of them. But because our cause is righteous, they haven't defeated us yet. And because our people are so much better. It's straight out of the fascist playbook. And in case there was any question about that, as soon as his speech is done, everybody starts yelling, Sig Zion, Sig Zion. Yeah, so there's that. The weirdest moment for me at the end of his speech, though, we get this beautiful series of stills of everyone on the bridge watching this speech. And you suddenly realize that perhaps with the exception of Bright and maybe Ryu Jose, none of them understand who they're fighting. They don't have a clue. Amuro suddenly sees this and is like, oh, this is the enemy. 
which again comes back to some of the soldier psychology stuff we were talking about before. Bright's initial reaction is, this is nonsense. They want a dictatorship. <laughs> this is all lies and hypocrisy. But he is never, perhaps because he feels like it's, well, of course, everybody knows why Zion is bad. He's never really talked to the crew about it or explained it. But for them, since it's never been laid out, it's been that much harder to fight Zeon. When they're just some people who, for reasons you don't understand, you're constantly having to battle, that's awful. When they're like Literal an Literal space Nazis. An authoritarian cult. <laughs> Suddenly, you understand a little better why you need to go out and fight them. Suddenly, you have some of, you know, a little bit of emotional distance on the people that you have to fight. And so in this episode, Amuro goes from being dazed, being dissociated, doing everything mechanically, to this feeling of epiphany, like he suddenly had a realization about the world. Well, and about why Bright is the way he is about fighting. You know, and we know, we as the audience know Bright's tired. We as the audience know Bright is afraid. And if we remember from the first episode, Bright joined the army after the war started. And in this episode, we see Bright's response to this speech. You know, those fascists just want to create a dictatorship. Bright is a true believer in the war. Bright is somebody who probably joined up because he didn't want to live under a Zabi dictatorship. But having grown up on a neutral side, most of our crew don't understand or haven't understood until this moment why. <laughs> it just occurred to me as we were discussing this, but... When Degwin is sitting in his room listening to the message from Garma, he's very similar to Amaro sitting in his room tinkering on the computer. And when Kaecilia has to come in and drag her father out to the funeral, it's very similar to Ryu coming in and dragging Amaro out to the Gundam. Mm-hmm. Random other tidbits. Kaecilia, we know, has sent someone looking for Char. We don't know why yet. The um. timing of this is actually really significant, I think, because she does this during Garma's funeral. Well, she probably notices that Char's not there, which is significant. Mm -hmm. I think it shows her to be very cold, calculating, scheming even, even in the midst of this funeral for her younger brother. We have no reason to think she didn't like, but she has a plan. And it seems to be a plan that is... Not incompatible with Char's plan? Perhaps. And it's not a plan that she's involving her other siblings in. I gotta say, Char looks super dapper. <laughs> in his leisure suit in his, and aviators. In his white suit and aviator glasses. And he's just hanging out in a bar, watching the funeral. Bad-mouthing Garma. It's very brief, but we also get a little moment with Bright. Poor Bright who is exhausted. They're all working as hard as they can. I imagine they are under crewed. You know, a base the size of the white base should probably have much more crew than they have at their disposal, or at least more experienced crew. They haven't had enough free time to make essential repairs. And so they're operating with their engines at lower than usual capacity. He's getting snippy and he makes himself go take a break. And he gets about 30 seconds of break. <laughs> Before they get attacked again. But in those 30 seconds, Mirai comes to visit him, which makes me wonder if we get some bright and Mirai romansu on the horizon. And if that's the ship, you know who's piloting it. Come on, you laughed the first time I said that. <laughs> I did, it's true. We actually get a lot of sort of brief moments of intimacy in this episode. We have Mirai coming to check on Bright. We have Haman with Rambaral putting a hand on his shoulder while he's on the bridge. They share a kiss before he gets into his mobile suit. And then at the end, when everyone is on the bridge of the white base watching the funeral, Fra comes up to Amaro and puts a hand on his shoulder when she comes to check on him and make sure he's all right. It's the most physical affection we've seen, really, between characters. And the most natural physical affection. Nobody's shy or uncomfortable. There's a sense of rightness to all these moments. We get a series of shots of people in their rooms, and all the rooms are like cells. Like, mm. when we first get the shot of Amuro's room, it feels like an institution. <laughs> it does. It does. Brights, too. Yeah. All, um, well, all of them. And the room that Fra and the orphans are in. They yeah. all <laughs> I, I noticed it. I didn't know what to say about it. 
Okay. Um, I mean, I think it's interesting. It speaks to their mental states and the visual, the ambitious visuals of the episode. And perhaps the cheap and inadequate execution. Perhaps. We have enough time to draw a room. Do not put anything in it. Well, and the... So these series of rooms all look more or less identical, with very slight changes. It's a plain metal box with a tiny high window and a single light in the middle of the ceiling. It feels like a mental institution, uh, particularly when you see Amaro sitting there in the single patch of light, like working on something diligently by himself. And Fra comes and leaves him some food. And then she's like, all right, I'm going to go. I'll come back for that tray later. Well, and then... When we see Bright in his room, he goes and he sits in his recliner that is there. But again, it's basically an empty metal box with a single window and a single beam of light. A recliner is the captain's privilege. And then again, with Frabo and the orphans sitting in the middle of one of these blank metal boxes, being afraid of the lightning storm. The perhaps more generous part of me would like to think that they're kind of speaking to their mental state, that it's meant to feel a bit like an institution because... Or like a prison. They're all kind of trapped in this never-ending battle, it seems. They never get a break. They never get any peace. They never get to rest. They're all afraid. They're all tired. (laughs) And in a way, at the end, when they all gather on the bridge again, it's... Giran's speech, as much as it was meant to rally Zeon, it's Giran's speech that brings all of them together and reminds them what they're all fighting for. Absolutely. Well, and we go from very cold colors and stark contrasts in those rooms where everyone is separated, right? Everyone's broken up either alone and, or into littler groups to everyone together in this very warm light. The bridge in that scene is lit very yellow. And it's worth noting that those earlier scenes take place during a thunderstorm. Weather like that, especially the lightning crashing, the stark colors, is often used in film, in art, to express people's emotional state, especially when there is a certain amount of chaos that is subsumed before a seemingly placid surface. It's also possible they just didn't want to have to draw rooms that were full of stuff. But let's give them some credit. We talked before, we think this was a very ambitiously conceived episode, and this was probably part of that. During our first impressions, I mentioned that I thought there was something a little weird about the direction in this episode, and that the animation quality swung wildly between really good and totally inconsistent. I did some research on the particular people responsible for directing this episode, and it turns out that my guess was actually right. First, a brief refresher about the different kinds of directors working on any episode of Gundam. There's the series director, Tomino, who is in charge of everything for the whole series. Then each episode has a director who is in charge of that episode. They oversee the storyboards, production, animation, music, sound, backgrounds, everything for that particular episode. Because of the way that animation is produced, multiple episodes are always in production at any given time, so a show will have a bunch of different episode directors, each of whom handles usually one out of every few episodes. Below the episode director is the animation director. Their job is to oversee all the animation and to ensure that it's both good and consistent. Below that person are the animators and the storyboard artist, who takes instructions from everybody I just mentioned and draws the storyboards that establish, in shot-by-shot detail, how the whole episode is going to work. Episode 12 is unique among all the episodes of First Gundam because it had two episode directors, Kanda Takayuki and Yokoyama Yuichiro, and it was the only episode of First Gundam that either man directed. So Yokoyama was mostly a storyboard artist throughout his career, although he had, by this point, directed 15 episodes of Sunrise's previous popular giant robot anime, Combattler V, in 1976. Kanda, though still early on in his career, had already directed as series director The Adventures of the Little Prince, and during the production of Gundam, was also directing Sunrise's The Ultraman. Neither man would work on Gundam again during the Tomino years, but both would return to work together on 1996's 8th Mobile Suit Team, with Kanda as series director and Yokoyama again doing storyboards. It's up to the audience to speculate whether or not their work on episode 12 is the reason they did not come (laughs) back to do other work on Gundam, or if this was a situation where Sunrise and the Gundam team were short-staffed, they needed some desperate help, and so Sunrise brought in some people who were mostly working on other projects. Either one is possible. We'll talk a lot more about Kanda when we eventually get to 8th Mobile Suit Team. In a few years. 
If, like us, you're thinking, hey, this was a really well-written episode, then you might be interested to know the scriptwriter for this episode was Matsuzaki Kenichi, who is generally credited as the man who invented Minofsky particles for Gundam, and he would go on to be the head writer for Super Dimension Fortress Macross. And while we're talking about the production, a side note about episode 11. Remember how bad the animation got right at the end there? Well, the animation director, who, if you remember, is the person responsible for making sure that the animation in an episode is good and consistent, for episode 11 was Oizumi Manabu. And that's weird, because Oizumi Manabu is not credited with working on any other anime production in any role. And that's because Oizumi Manabu is actually a pseudonym for prolific animator and animation director Tomizawa Kazuo. He's credited as animation director for four first Gundam episodes, so I suspect that he used a pseudonym on episode 11 because he didn't want his name associated with the animation in it for some reason. <laughs> Clever. So if any episodes of Mobile Suit Breakdown come up that I don't like, I won't be Nina, I will be Tina. <laughs> If you're Tina, am I Nam? Tim. Tim, obviously, Tim. When I talked about the visuals of this episode, particularly the rooms that felt like cells in a mental hospital, the lightning storm, it tickled a memory in the back of my brain, and it took me a while to figure out precisely what it was I was remembering. And it came to me all of a sudden. The visuals in this episode remind me of the 1963 film Shock Corridor, written and directed by Samuel Fuller. Now, Fuller is quite a famous director. If you haven't heard of Shock Corridor, you may have heard of some of his other movies, the film noir Pick Up on South Street, and the war epic The Big Red One. He also, while in the army during World War II, took documentary footage of Nazi atrocities, including concentration camps. His films are characterized by low budgets and pulp-style writing, with a focus on marginalized characters, such as pickpockets, mental hospital patients, orphans, and sex workers. His films also contain a lot of anti-racist elements, including casting a Japanese-American actor, James Shigeta, as a romantic lead opposite a white actress in the 1959 film noir The Crimson Kimono. Shock Corridor is about a journalist who pretends to be mentally ill so that he can be committed to an institution and find out about a horrible murder that took place there. Within the hospital, the inmates all represent a microcosm of the tumultuous 60s. The Red Scare and communism, segregation and racism, the arms race and nuclear war, and the sexual revolution. I'll include links in the show notes to still shots such as the bare cells, the light through the windows, and perhaps the most famous scene in Shock Corridor, a scene where our character, actually becoming ill himself from the fact that he's been living in this place, believes the hallway that he's walking through to have a raging lightning storm going in the hallway. It's beautifully shot. So I'll have those links in the show notes so you can see what I mean by thinking there might be some connection between these films. Now, Fuller is not a named influence for any of the people who we've looked into as involved in Mobile Suit Gundam. So we can't know for sure. And Fuller is also famous for working outside of the studio system. I don't know that he would have gotten very wide international distribution. However, many of the people involved in Mobile Suit Gundam went to film school, they received film training, not specifically animation training, and so may have had an opportunity to see his films and been influenced by his style. Yeah, and one of the two directors on this episode, Kanda, is noted for the influence of various Western directors on his style. The other person who might have had a major influence on the style of the visuals in this episode is the storyboard artist, who would have actually laid out each of these individual scenes. And interestingly, in episode 12, the storyboard artist was Tomino himself, working under a pseudonym. And we know Tomino, trained as a live-action director, took directing very seriously, and so may have wanted to inject some of this sort of low-budget documentary but very emotional style into this episode of Gundam. I got really curious about the line Ryu Jose says when he's talking to Bright about Amuro. He says, it seems Amuro has got that rookie syndrome. Now, I've never heard of rookie syndrome, at least not in this context, and after some searching, I couldn't find 
any references to it in English or Japanese. What Ryu actually says in Japanese is, to my ears and after a few dozen listens, with my help, Shinmai no hetai no yoku kakaru byoki ni naterunde. Or, in a more literal translation, he's become sick with what new soldiers often contract. So, he's got that rookie syndrome is pretty close to literal and suggests to me that the official translators didn't actually have any better idea what Ryu was talking about than I do. After some more digging, I discovered an internal report prepared by Japan's Imperial Secret Police, the Kempeitai, after the beginning of the Second Sino-Japanese War, i.e. the Japanese invasion of China in 1937. And this report examined the causes of what they had determined to be the abnormally high rate of suicide by Japanese soldiers. At this point, it was something like twice the average rate for the civilian population. The conclusions they came to are not good, and you can probably guess what they were. But they did collect some good data, including the fact that younger, newer recruits were the demographic most likely to attempt suicide. Rather than lack of patriotism, cowardice, weakness, or emotional defects, I think it was much more likely because these were younger soldiers who were more emotionally volatile, like all 20-year-olds are, who were abused mercilessly by their senior officers, provided with copious alcohol instead of any meaningful form of recreation, and were just riddled with syphilis. <laughs> oh my god, really? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that, that wouldn't help. Nope. During the war, there were quite a few stories about Japanese soldiers heroically sacrificing themselves or volunteering for suicide missions, well before any of the kamikaze stuff happened. And there were persistent rumors at the time, probably true, that a lot of those soldiers volunteered for those suicide missions because it was better than living with syphilis. But whatever the causes, there was a trend, observable and noted by the Kempeitai, in the Japanese military of rookie soldiers struggling psychologically. So there was probably a widespread conscious or subconscious awareness of that trend in 1970s Japan, and it got lost somewhere in translation across language, culture, and time before it got to me. Large public funerals and their politicization is a tradition as old as Anthony and Brutus eulogizing <laughs> Julius Caesar. It's older than that. It is, as a matter of fact. <laughs> In the West, at least, the practice dates back to at least the 5th century BCE, when it was common for Greek cities to hold large public funerals complete with oration for their war dead. The most famous of these is probably Pericles' funeral oration, as recounted by Thucydides in his History of the Peloponnesian War. What was special about Pericles' funeral oration is that instead of focusing on the great deeds of individual men, he focused on the achievements and greatness of Athens, its culture, its law, its army, and contrasted it with neighboring cities. Athens and its citizens were special and superior. Then he links this praise to the men he's eulogizing, saying, For the Athens that I have celebrated is only what the heroism of these and their like have made her, holding that vengeance upon their enemies was more to be desired than any personal blessings, and reckoning this to be the most glorious of hazards. They joyfully determined to accept the risk. Thus, choosing to die resisting, rather than live submitting, they fled only from dishonor. Having judged that to be happy means to be free, and to be free means to be brave, do not shy away from risk of war. So died these men as becomes Athenians. You, their survivors, must determine to have as unfaltering a resolution in the field, though you may pray that it may have a happier outcome. Sounds an awful lot like Giron's talking points, doesn't it? Yeah. He concludes that the greatest honor and act of valor in Athens is to live and die for freedom of the state, the state that Pericles believes is different and more special than any other neighboring state. Still sounds like Giron. So one of the oldest of the Greek tragedies that we have, Sophocles' Antigone, actually engages directly with the role that the state has in these public funerals and in deciding who is a hero and who is not. And the role that the ceremony and pomp that the state can bestow upon a particular deceased person has in defining reality. So in the play Antigone, in the preamble to the play, before the play has even begun, two brothers, the co-rulers of the city of Thebes, 
Polynices and Ateocles have quarreled. They had agreed to share the rule by alternating years, but at the end of his year, Ateocles refused to give up the throne. Polynices, his brother, fled, raised an army, returned, and besieged Thebes. The two brothers fought outside the seventh gate of the city and killed each other. Their uncle Creon, now the king, decreed that Ateocles, who had refused to give up his throne, had died a hero defending Thebes. And his brother Polynices, who raised an army to defend his right to the throne, was a traitor. So Ateocles received a full state funeral with all the honors, and Polynices was left to rot on the battlefield. Antigone, sister to the two dead brothers, defied the tyrant's order and gave her brother Polynices the sacred funeral rites that were decreed by the gods. Creon, enraged, ordered her arrested and executed. He later recanted, but by then Antigone had taken her own life. This is usually interpreted as a play about establishing the superiority of divine law and personal conscience over mortal authority. But I read it more as a criticism of the way that rulers can use ritual and ceremony to arbitrarily define reality for their own purposes. Between Polynices and Ateocles, which brother is actually in the wrong? From a certain perspective, Ateocles created the war by violating their agreement and seizing power unlawfully. From that perspective, it's Polynices who's the hero. But Creon is the king now, and he wants the people of the city to know that virtue equals following the orders of whoever happens to be the king, whatever those orders are, and opposing even an unlawful, foolish, or evil order from the king is treason. What a weird position for a king to take. As we'll see moving forward, that is largely what these big public funerals are for. They are for exalting whatever the virtue of the day is. We see additional examples of this throughout history. For instance, when the Duke of Wellington died, his funeral, which took two months to prepare and involved a two-mile procession through London, was attended by more than one and a half million people. It was a celebration of his military career as a man who defeated Napoleon, but at the same time, it was a celebration and demonstration of the power of the British Empire. Here you have a man who's got four coffins in an enormous bronze funeral car festooned with spears and helmet crests and cannons pulled by 12 black horses with black ostrich feather headdresses and accompanied by 10,000 marchers. In the end, it's all about demonstrations of wealth and power. And that isn't us reading into this. That is what Queen Victoria said. She said, <laughs> I want this guy's funeral to be a demonstration of the power and wealth of my empire. And so it was. You know, he's not even using those other three coffins. What a waste. I mean, I think they're nested like a turducken. Like, he's inside one, and then that coffin's inside a bigger coffin, and that coffin's inside a bigger coffin, and that coffin's inside a bigger coffin. How do we know that there are actually more coffins in there? How do we know that the coffin maker didn't just make one big coffin and pocket the money? I guess we don't. During our research on this, I started looking at the funerals of the Japanese imperial family around World War II, and I was hoping that I was going to find some prince of the blood who died during the war, but even though all three of Hirohito's brothers fought in World War II, none of them died during it. So I looked a little bit further back at the funerals of Hirohito's father, the Taisho Emperor, and his grandfather, the Meiji Emperor. In particular, I was struck by the visual similarity between the Meiji Emperor's funeral and Garma's. So the Meiji Emperor's funeral took place at a point when the Japanese imperial house had adopted Western military style. It was the fashion of the time for nobles to hold military rank and to wear military uniforms as their official dress. Aha! Uh -huh. Thus, the funeral procession of the Meiji Emperor is lined with soldiers, and all the dignitaries in attendance are dressed in full Western style regalia, just like the Xi'an notables on the dais at Garma's funeral. I also noticed, and this was a little odd, but during Garma's procession, there appear to be priests leading the pallbearers into the ceremony. I have no idea who or what these guys are supposed to be, because this is, as far as I can remember, the closest we're going to get to religion in Gundam until Sioux Courtism shows up 35 years from now. They do kind of look like Shinto priests, and so they kind of look like the Shinto priests who led the Meiji Emperor's procession in his funeral. And there's one other thing about the Meiji Emperor's funeral that I want to talk about, and that's suicide again. During the Meiji Emperor's funeral, one of his generals, General Nogi Maresuke, committed Junshi, the ritual suicide of a vassal who desires to follow his lord into death. 
This is, of course, very odd for this era. This wasn't the sort of thing that was expected of him by any means, and it was actually quite controversial at the time. Lots of academics and intelligentsia in Japan really thought that this was a totally backward custom that was inappropriate for a modern, industrialized, wealthy nation like Japan. I was going to say, the Meiji era saw a lot of westernization in Japan and a lot of modernization, and so it feels particularly strange for one of the Meiji emperor's vassals to do this. Though this is a guy who had grown up as a samurai warrior in the Tokugawa Bakufu. Mm. So he had been steeped in this tradition. And it's a little more complex. He's going to end up being a propaganda icon for the Japanese imperialist, militarist, pseudo-modern Bushido thing, because the government, after his death, is going to create a massive propaganda campaign to lionize him and his willingness to die for the emperor and for the nation as reflecting the highest values of the Japanese martial spirit. He's going to become an icon of fidelity for the new Japanese mindset. But the circumstances behind his suicide are a lot more complex. He was a general during the Russo-Japanese War, and in that war he was in command of one of the bloodiest battles of the war, one where there is good reason to think that his choice of tactics resulted in massive unnecessary bloodshed and huge losses of Japanese life that probably didn't need to happen. He was deeply ashamed of this, and it didn't help that both of his sons died during the war. After the war, when he was being hailed as a hero by the press, he privately went to the Meiji Emperor and asked for permission to commit suicide to atone for his shame, and mm. he was denied. The Meiji Emperor ordered him to stay alive as long as the Emperor was alive. Ah. He spent the rest of his life dedicating himself to philanthropic causes, donated his entire quite substantial personal fortune to building hospitals for veterans of the war, memorials to those who had died. He was influential in getting international scouting going in Japan, and for a little while he was the headmaster of the special school set up for the children of the highest nobility. It's so sad. You sort of understand his reaction in the short term, and then you wonder if over all those years and over all of those attempts to do good in society, you know, you might assume that he recovered somewhat or came to terms with what had happened. But no, the whole time he was just waiting. Well, going back to our conversation some episodes ago about ideal masculinity within the terms of Bushido, he was faithful to his lord, and he sought what opportunities he could find to do good until he no longer had to. If we jump forward and talk about the era Mobile Suit Gundam is ostensibly about, World War II, we have a few very different examples <laughs> of funerals from different parts of the conflict. When Franklin Delano Roosevelt died on April 12th, 1945, it felt very sudden to the American public. He had actually been ill for quite some time, but this had been kept carefully under wraps to avoid any kind of a morale crisis. And his funeral was comparatively small for a U.S. president. It was not a huge state funeral. They still had the decorated train that carried him to Washington. Mourners still lined the train route. They did have a funeral in Washington before he was buried at one of his family homes. But compared to <laughs> one of the big state funerals that typically is accorded a U.S. president or former president, it was quite subdued. And this was a conscious decision. It was felt that it would be disrespectful to the war effort to have a lot of pomp and a very expensive ceremony before the war had been completed. After VE Day, they actually had some additional ceremonies for him because it was felt that now that the war was over, they could do that. Reinhard Heydrich, on the other hand, had an exceptionally elaborate funeral. Now, Heydrich is one of the darkest figures among the Nazi elite and one of the main architects of the Holocaust. Among his various gruesome nicknames is the Man with the Iron Heart. He, however, was assassinated by a pair of soldiers in a mission masterminded by the Czechoslovakian government in exile. His funeral and the events leading up to it took three days and included torchlit processions, a lying in state, performances by the state orchestra. Heinrich Himmler himself gave the eulogy and used it to expound on Heydrich's supposed virtues, the superiority of the Third Reich and the inferiority of their enemies. They also essentially raised the town that had helped the assassins escape, killing every man over the age of 12 and sending all the remaining women and children to concentration camps. 
On the Japanese side, during the war, people on both sides of the conflict believed that Japan's kamikaze pilots were being plied with all manner of perks. Extra-long furlough, food, drink, prostitutes, elaborate ceremonial send-offs before their missions, and heroes' funerals after. None of this was true. <laughs> and Except it, probably the drink. It's unclear whether the Japanese media or propaganda apparatus spread the story to improve recruitment, mollify grieving families, scare the Americans, or some combination thereof. Finally, we have Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto, who planned most Japanese naval actions of the Pacific War, including the attack on Pearl Harbor, and was shot down by American pilots. While he was on a morale-boosting inspection trip of the Japanese-held Pacific Islands, the Allies managed to intercept and decode messages containing his itinerary. His plane and its escorts were intercepted and shot down over Bougainville Island. How has there not been a movie of this? How did they make Michael Bay's Pearl Harbor and they didn't make a movie of this? Yeah, I well, and it's called like Operation Vengeance or something like that. They gave it a, <laughs> it had that sort of name. I had not actually heard this story prior to doing this research. I had no idea we managed to get, as the Americans put it in their dispatches, Yamamoto before the end of the war. After his death, he was posthumously promoted, given a small mountain of imperial awards and commendations, including the Grand Order of the Chrysanthemum First Class, the highest military honor in Japan. He became only the 12th Japanese person to receive a state funeral, and in part of the myth of the man, and in part of the state co-opting his death to promote its own interests, the media widely reported that he had told his family before leaving for the front, Do not consider me your father anymore, for I have given my body and soul to the country. It will be my supreme glory to die for my country. So to sum it up, the history of these kinds of funerals is very long. And in pretty much every case... They are demonstrations of power and wealth, and an opportunity to exalt whatever virtues are most desired by the political apparatus of the time. That's kind of a weird quote from Yamamoto, since wasn't he pretty estranged from his family? <laughs> yes, one of the sources I read about it made the point that he was a man who did not really know his children, had not spent much time with them, and they were not very close. And the love of his life was actually a geisha, with whom he spent quite a bit of time, rather than his wife. What? I just think that's a really good excuse he came up with. <laughs> I've been a terrible father and husband to you because of the war and the nation. That's why. <laughs> not because I love to gamble and hang out with geisha. Okay, going off to the front. Bye! I want to point out, I went back and rewatched part of the episode, and during Giren's speech, we get a lot of reaction shots from the white base crew. We've got Amuro and Frau looking angry and determined, Bright looking grim, Mirai looking horrified, and we remember that this is meant to be our future. These are characters who have learned about the Holocaust, and they know, just as well as we do watching the show, what Sigzion means. But I do want to point out one reaction in particular. Sela looks shocked at first, and then she looks down at the ground. Disgust, maybe? Shame, maybe? Disappointment? Lots of heavy stuff in this episode about space Nazis. So let's take a break from all of that serious historical analysis and talk about some cool robots and sweet spaceships. I'm going to be talking about Zeon's new ship, the Zanzibar, and Rambaral's new mobile suit, but I'm not going to give the name of the mobile suit yet because, hey, did you notice that we went this whole episode without getting the name of the new mobile suit? All we know is that it is Nozaku. Yeah, it's a bit weird, right? Now, I don't think there's any special significance to the fact that they haven't mentioned the name of this suit, except that it reminds us that at this point, Sunrise is still operating without the benefit of a well-established formula for how you do things in a Gundam show. There are still a lot of rough edges that need to be sanded off over time before we get to, say, Re-96, where the end of every episode features a commercial for Gunpla of whatever mobile suit was introduced in that episode. Do they do a new mobile suit every episode? Yeah, more or less. Wow. Yeah, for fun times, watch any other Gundam show and count how many new mobile suits get introduced in the first 12 episodes. Because <laughs> this is the first truly new mobile suit that's been introduced this whole show. The gun cannon and gun tank are kind of new when they show up, but they've been showing up in background shots the whole series. This is the first truly new one. 
So the Zanzibar, like the Magellan in Episode 4 and the Salamis in Episode 5, is a part of the Zanzibar class of ships, and by some astronomically unlikely coincidence, it might actually be the third class leader, aka the first ship of its class and the one the class is named after, to encounter the white base during its brief time in service. Since Shars Musai is never named except as the Musai, there's a plausible argument that it might also be a class leader, which would make the Zanzibar the fourth. Anyway, names aside, the Zanzibar is Xeon's equivalent to the White Base. It is a multi-environment mobile suit carrier that can enter and exit Earth's atmosphere and can carry six mobile suits, the same as the White Base, and more than a Musai. It's not clear how many more, since how many the Musai carries and how exactly they are stored has been the subject of much debate and speculation among the fans, but it's definitely more. Of course it has. I'm now just imagining the debates online with people posting various screenshots of various episodes and series being like, no, but look at the comparative size here. And no, but this one issue of this obscure Gundam fan magazine from Japan gives dimensions and... <laughs> you make it sound like that's not exactly what has happened. Oh, no, I know it's exactly <laughs> what has happened. I just think it's funny. <laughs> Unlike the white base, which is able to hover indefinitely thanks to Minovsky particles, once in Earth atmosphere the Zanzibar relies on sustained thrust and aerodynamics to stay airborne. The Zanzibar and white base are remarkably matched in armaments. Each mounts a double-barreled main gun of similar caliber. The white base's is 58 centimeters, Zanzibar's is 60 centimeters, as well as four mega particle guns. The white base has eight machine gun turrets to the Zanzibar's five, but don't hold your breath waiting for those machine guns to make any kind of a difference in any fight. The white base has more missile launching tubes, but the Zanzibar has bigger ones. Fun side note about the Zanzibar, this is one of the first machines to appear in the show with a design that is credited to Tomino himself. Okuara Kunio, the lead mecha designer for First Gundam, is only credited with cleaning up Tomino's design. Supposedly, Tomino roughed out designs for a ton of the later appearing tech, so we'll keep an eye out for that as we go along. As for the new blue mobile suit, it's designed specifically for ground combat, with performance significantly better than the Zaku 2. It is compatible with any of the Zaku's weapons, including the machine gun, bazooka, and superheated axe, called a heat hawk. But it's also built with its own integrated weaponry, the flexi-flexi shocking tentacle weapon called the heat rod that can be used for electrified grappling or superheated slicing, and easily missed since in this episode it only appears in one brief shot during the battles, the suit's left hand is actually a hand-shaped five-barreled machine gun. I couldn't find any explanation for why this new mobile suit is such a spiky boy with shoulder horns <laughs> that wouldn't look out of place on a cartoon Viking helmet. But my personal theory is that the Zabi family was so happy with whoever designed their evil monster headquarters that they just <laughs> that they let that architect design a mobile suit. For extra fun, let's compare the armaments we've been discussing to some real-world weapons to give a sense of the scale of these weapons. First, the Zanzibar's twin 60cm cannons. During World War II, the Germans deployed a 60cm caliber mortar called Karl Gerat that was originally designed to destroy France's Maginot Line defensive fortifications. These were the largest self-propelled artillery weapons to ever see combat. The shells it fired were so heavy, weighing just shy of 5,000 pounds each, that they were carried by specially modified panzer tanks, each of which could carry a grand total of four. These shells were designed to breach fortifications and could penetrate through 2.5 meters of concrete. They left craters 15 meters wide and 5 meters deep. So now picture two of those mounted next to each other, and another pair just slightly smaller on the white base. And hey, you might be thinking, if you happen to be a Pacific War history buff, didn't the Japanese Navy also mount main battleship guns that were roughly equivalent but just slightly bigger than their US counterparts? They did! The Japanese fielded 46 centimeter guns on the Yamato-class super battleships and 41 centimeters on the Nagato-class battleships, while US guns topped out at 40.6 centimeters on the Iowa and Montana battleships. What a crazy coincidence! That's all for tech today. Next time, we'll talk gun fingers and face vulcans, or maybe how many homes you could power with the energy from a single beam saber. And at some point soon, we will talk in more depth about lead mech designer Okawara Kunio. Next time on episode 1.13, Mothers Are Complex. It's more ominous in Japanese. A sensual mid-air docking. Who gave that child a gun? A traditional anime bathing suit episode. 
Surprise, it's bullets! Strangers with candy. Reason number 237 to silence your phone. And putting away childish things. Will you be able to survive? Make sure you do all the podcast things. Like, subscribe, share, and pledge your undying devotion to Mobile Suit Breakdown on fine podcast services everywhere and on YouTube. Follow us on Twitter at Gundam Podcast. Check out our website, GundamPodcast.com, for episodes, show notes, and more. And you can email your questions, comments, and complaints to GundamPodcast at gmail.com. Or shout your wrong Gundam opinion to us directly by coming to scenic New York City and yelling that just because they say Sieg Zeon doesn't make them Nazis, maybe they're just speaking German on any busy street corner. We'll totally hear you. The intro song is Wasp by Misha Dioxin. The closing music is Long Way Home by Spinning Ratio. You can find links and more in the show notes. And thank you for listening. I did those. Um, the runway ramp. One, one of them, one of them I did U.S. style, and one of them I did <laughs> Japanese style. So. Whoops. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs>